Well, hello again, friends and family of God, God Most High. Passover is almost here. I hope you get a chance to see this and listen to it before Passover. Are you spiritually and mentally ready to participate in remembering the greatest victory that, that Jesus Christ depicts by the Passover? It's the event that opens the door for so many things, including the defeat of Satan and death, inaugurating the new covenant in Christ's blood, and having our sins all erased, all of them, every single one of them. Yeah, even that one and those, <laughs> all of them. And then we're reconciled with God Almighty. Plus, we get the right to become the children of God, as, first, I mean, as John 1 says. And Jesus continues to save us even as we still stumble in sin, for 1 John 1, 7, the blood of Jesus cleanses, has an ongoing tense, cleanses us. Or if we don't prepare properly, we're warned of some very dire consequences. So we need this topic. We need this reminder. We need to do it and then come with a solemn joy to pass over and really celebrate the victory. If we don't prepare properly, we're warned of some dire consequences. So we need this topic and this reminder. 1 Corinthians 1, 27 to 29. 1 Corinthians 1, 27 to 29 um, is Paul's accounting of what he'd heard from maybe Christ himself and maybe from Luke and others. Uh, verse 27, therefore, whoever eats this bread, 1 Corinthians 11, or drinks this cup of the Lord, it's his cup. It's his bread in an unworthy manner. Don't let that be you. Be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. That sounds pretty dire. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat. It doesn't say examine yourself and decide not to keep it. Examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. So this is serious business. We can't just rush into the Passover service, maybe stick a tie, a necktie on while we're uh, you know, arriving in the car, sit down at the last minute. No, we're exhorted to examine ourselves and be ready and understand what we're going to do and about to do and esteem the body of Christ. I'll be focused on that shortly after a few reminders and opening comments. I want to comment on first. But this short teaching is about being in the best frame of mind possible for the most meaningful Passover service you can ever have. I'm in touch with various ones and various denominations even, and it's interesting how each one plans for Passover. But what's essential to me, at least, is that you be ready, you be prepared. Be sure you're ready to take Passover in a worthy manner, as Scripture says. So thank you everyone for coming. I am Philip Shields. This will be my 52nd Passover. I know I posted one with 34 or something like that. Well, that was given years ago. This one is my 52nd Passover. I guess that means I'm getting old. But it's a busy time of year, so pressures come on all of us um, to not be as prepared as we should be. We have to deleven, after all, our homes and prepare for the big meal the next day, uh, the next night, and be ready for Passover and deal with our job and, and all kinds of things that come up. I'd also like to remind us all to commemorate the Wave Sheaf Day, a day of Christ as the first fruit, which will be the first of the week, the first day of the week. Actually, the Greek is the first of the weeks in John, I think it's 20, John 20, April 9 in 2023, April 9. It's not a holy day. I have a sermon on it that you can listen to. I'll put it in my notes about what a great and inspiring day this is. This wave sheaf day. A lot of us have kind of shied away from it because it so often, like this year, is actually on the very same day as Easter is. But that's the way it is. Anyway, uh, there are two very other interest. There are two very interesting other facts about the calendar this year. The first one is it's very interesting that 2023 Passover is one where all the various factions um, of belief on the calendar can come together at least this year, to the best of my knowledge. Those who are citing the new moon in Jerusalem, those who use the rabbinic calendar, the Hebrew calendar, those using the spring equinox, all will be keeping Passover day on April 5, Wednesday, the day. And of course, the eve of Passover is 
April 4th, okay, the night before, the dates are always sundown to sundown, and the first holy day, April 6th, Thursday, to the following holy day that ends on April 12th, Wednesday, and First Fruits Wave Sheaf Day. It's not really technically Resurrection Day because he was resurrected just before sundown the night before. But anyway, he, this was the day that he showed himself to Mary of Magdala and rises up to be accepted by the Father on our behalf. Even Catholics and Protestants will be keeping their Easter on April 9. Of course, we true believers do not keep pagan Easter. Second point, this year's Passover and Days of Unleavened Bread calendar matches the calendar the year Messiah was nailed to the stake or cross. He had to be in the tomb for exactly three days and three nights or he could not be our Messiah. The only sign he gave that he was the Messiah is found in Matthew, 20, uh, Matthew 12, verses 39 to 40. We know he was resurrected just before sundown, Sabbath evening, because that he was placed into the tomb just before sundown. And so he was resurrected, no doubt, at sundown. So by the time the women came to the tomb, they didn't see him resurrected, being resurrected. No, they saw the tomb already empty. So it could have happened hours before that, and it did. We know he was resurrected just before sundown Sabbath evening, okay? And uh, because the, the, the day he died was the preparation day for the next day, we're told in John. Uh, I'll, I'll have that in the notes, the exact verse. The, the next day, John 19, actually it is. John 19, verses 30 to 32. The very next day was a high day, meaning a holy day, uh, an annual Sabbath. That was the Sabbath that was meant by John when he wrote this. So John 19, verses 30 to 32 so when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, finished. Believe in the Greek, it just is finished. Not it is finished. But anyway, in bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. There is a spirit of man that goes to God. Okay, he gave up his spirit. Therefore, because it was the preparation day that the ladies, the, the ladies, that the bodies, I'm thinking of Mary Magdalene and all that. Uh, because it was a preparation day that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, John adds. That means it was not a regular weekly Sabbath. That means it was an annual Sabbath, the ones that are listed in Leviticus 23. That next day was the first day of unleavened bread, a high day. The Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken. Nice guys, these, huh? And that they might be taken away. And you broke their knees, their legs. Um, they couldn't support themselves at all. And they died of asphyxiation at that point. Then if you keep reading, you find that he was put in the tomb just before sunset. A tomb owned by Joseph of Arimathea. No one had ever lain in it. Uh, remember that the day before any weekly or annual Sabbath, it's called the preparation day. But remember that Sabbath. Again, remember that Sabbath was a high day. The holy day of the first day of unleavened bread. So that's what it says in Luke 23, 54. That day was the preparation and the Sabbath drew near. I strongly urge you to listen to my teaching on Christ, the wave chief who rose to, to heaven to be accepted on our behalf. Uh, John 20, verse 1 and 2, and the Greek actually says on the first of the weeks because they started counting the various weeks and Sabbaths up to Pentecost. At that point, it had begun. The count had begun. So here's the, here's the sermon then. Okay, One more thing before we get into the Passover, though, in a worthy manner. One thing I've learned is that so many times Satan loves to throw things into the mix to distract us all. I mean, tests, trials, temptations. Take care of urgent and vital things, but don't let them win. And remember, there is a second Passover. If he tries to distract you with something so serious like a death in the family you have to attend to and all that, then do it the following month. I have an article under blogs, the second Passover. But these may come in the form, these, these distractions may come in the form of an illness, an accident, bad news with family members, death in the family, surgery you need all of a sudden, and other trials. Another tool Satan uses is if we let him to send you some very serious temptations probably hitting your weakest areas. 
and all of a sudden some of you if you're not being careful will find yourselves fighting what you thought uh, was already overcome what would have been a horrible sin if you just give in to it before Passover don't do it all of these are meant to distract us demoralize us discourage us so you don't feel like you're able to take Passover in a worthy manner in my case my wife and I both had COVID for two and a half weeks not that long ago uh, but at least I hope I have some antibodies now I hope and then I got a badly infected wound on my right index finger. It was almost impossible even to type. Now on top of, it's still infected as I pray for that, please. On top of that, my brother, who's been paralyzed and bedridden after several strokes and heart attacks, was just a few days ago rushed to the hospital. I understand last night he came home. He seemed near death. And notes from my oldest sister, whose entire right leg is likely to have to be amputated. It's all this is going on as well. And I had to arrange and help arrange for a ride for my brother to get back to his home from 45, 50 miles away where the hospital was. Um, and I don't want to get into all the details here, but please be praying for them. Lauren, my brother, 73, and Paula, my sister, 75 in Michigan. My brother's in California. Well, have you had some distractions? I'll bet you have. Have you had some tough temptations out of the blue? Like I said, don't let Satan win. And if he does win and you do sin, well, repent deeply and get back in the fight. We don't want you down there on the ground, bloodied as you might be. Get back up in the fight. Don't feed the likelihood of temptation by bad choices you make. Anyway, let's dive in now to the main topic of the sermon today. Taking Passover in a worthy manner. One of the biggest issues I've watched over the years is that some brethren look at the verses after about examining themselves and then decide Passover uh, and then and then taking Passover in a worthy manner after you do that and warnings if we don't do it that way, they some decide therefore, uh oh, I don't think I can take Passover. They decide they're not worthy enough to take Passover, so they stay home, they skip Passover. Not a good idea. Number two, they come to Passover but still feel unworthy of it and don't feel any joy of Passover when they're, all their sin debt has been forgiven. When in fact, Passover should be a commemoration of universe-shaking events that your Savior did for you and won the most titanic battle ever. Here was a flesh and blood human being filled with the Holy Spirit, I'm sure, filled with God the Father, I'm sure. But as far as what you could see, you'd see a flesh and blood human being fighting against Satan, the most powerful demonic spirit in the universe, and our Savior won for us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Sure, we're also remembering his death, but the tomb is empty. He won. Passover is kind of like our Independence Day from Satan and the world. Except now I'd also call it Dependence Day, as I find myself so dependent on Yeshua, on Jesus and Father. But there should be a sense of victory, celebration too. I think many of the Passovers I've been to seem like a funeral, like a dirge. But it's a victory. So though we're solemn because we are remembering the night that he died, or the night that he was arrested and he died the next day is what I should say. We should celebrate his life too. He won. He died, remember, at 3 p.m. Passover day. That's when God killed his lamb. That's when the lamb of God was sacrificed, 3 p.m. Just mention that for what it's worth. Sure, we're also remembering his death, okay? So the tomb is empty. We're, now we're to become like little children, Yeshua said. One of the biggest lessons from children is that they're so dependent on mom and dad for everything, especially little children. My webmaster, Scott, reminded me that when you're away working all day and then come home, children demand your time. They want to be with you. And they're dependent on you to help them do anything. Go, you know, go uh, take them to the ballpark or whatever it is. And hopefully they're not all just watching uh, movies and things or on their smartphone. I, do, I wouldn't even give a, a young child a smartphone. I would not. 
the ease with which they could see all kinds of things, even on TikTok, that would not be good for children at all, or anyone actually, to be watching. So we should be the same, dependent, wanting to spend time with our Abba, our Father. So let's find that balance. So let's read now, breaking into the Passover for 1 Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23. For I resolved from the Father, from the Lord, I mean, that which I also delivered to you. 1 Corinthians 11, 23. We're going to read all the way to 29. That the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Now, he didn't have any broken bones, but he did have broken skin. You could see his bones, it says in Psalm 22. Um, Isaiah 52, the end of it, and Isaiah 53 talks about him being just mauled like crazy. Forget these pictures you see in paintings of a barely scratched body. Take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Passover and even the next evening when we have the meal and all that. Yeah, bring up Exodus 12 and the... Uh, the Exodus uh, through the Red Sea and all that and what happened. But the focus, we should always constantly be saying that all this pointed to Jesus. Pointed to Jesus. The lambs that were killed, the blood being splashed, pointed to Jesus. 1 Corinthians 5, 7 says, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. So take and eat in remembrance of me. Make sure your Passover and Days of Unleavened Bread are about remembering Jesus Christ, more than remembering what happened in Exodus 12, which was all pointing to this. In the same manner, the end of verse 25, 1 Corinthians 11, 25 now, in the same manner he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. That was not just ordinary blood. That was new covenant blood. That was not just ordinary blood. It was the blood of the Son of God. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Again. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty. This is the scary part. If you don't prepare, if you drink of it, and eat of it in an unworthy manner, you will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread. He doesn't say examine yourself and then don't take it. He says examine yourself and then eat it and drink it. For a drink of the cup, for he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner. King James, I believe, says unworthily. I do prefer the unworthy manner of most of the translations and the New King James, which I use primarily, and drinks judgments to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. We're going to have a lot to say about that. Note verse 28, we're to examine ourselves. Not our pastor, not our spouse, not anyone else. Once we've examined ourselves, what does Paul say? So let him eat of the bread, drink of the cup. Paul's focus here is not on whether or not to take the Passover, but how we take it, in what frame of mind. We examine ourselves so we're in a proper state of mind before eating of his bread, drinking of his cup. Now, because Paul does say to examine yourself before eating and drinking, some decide this means we're to focus on ourselves for several weeks, on our sins, our failures, the existing issues that remain problematic in our lives sins we've committed in the past in the past year and commit to and now we commit to doing better in the coming year then we take the passover it does admittedly say examine yourselves but how and for what purpose i personally think i personally think that um just focusing on our existing issues our weaknesses will lead you to a wrong conclusion will not Put you in the right frame of mind, because you know you still have these weaknesses. Paul clearly says that when he focused on issues like coveting, that focus seemed to make him want to covet all the more. 
It's like if I say to you, pink elephant, do not think of a pink elephant. You've got to stop thinking of a pink elephant. Pink elephant, don't do it. Don't do it. By now you've thought of a pink elephant at least two or three times. So he says in Romans 7, verses 7 and 8, and that's what happens when we focus on our sins. The sins don't go away. So there is a better way. Romans 7, verses 7 and 8, NIV, New International Version. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. Indeed, I would not have known what sin is except through the law. I would not have known what coveting really is or was if the law hadn't said, do not covet. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of covetous desire. That's what I'm getting at here. For apart from the law, sin is dead. So he goes on to later say, our focus must be on the perfect life of Yeshua, who not only saved us, this is my body, this bread is my body, focus on that. This cup is my blood in the new covenant, focus on that, my blood, my body. But then he continues to save us, even as we continue to still sin from time to time, hopefully not nearly the way it was before conversion, before repentance and coming to God and Christ. But 1 John 1, verse 7 to 9 talks about that. We'll read that in a minute. But when we accept Yeshua, Jesus, as our Savior, Yeshua means salvation. That's the Hebrew name for Jesus. Never heard the word Jesus before. Hundreds of years went by. His blood washes away all our sins. We've been saved by grace through faith in the Messiah, Ephesians 2. We've been saved. But many of you don't believe we can say we've been saved because you look at your life and you say, I still sin. The Bible does say we've been saved, were saved, have been saved. Um, especially so when we find ourselves still sinning from time to time, even after receiving the Holy Spirit, it's hard to believe we've been saved. But I'm not going to deny all those times and verses the Bible says that. But now, But there's an explanation. Now that we're in the body of Christ... We're in his body. Ephesians 5, I think it's verse 30. I don't have it in my notes. It's just coming to me. Ephesians 5. Thank you, God. He helps me. <laughs> he helps me when I'm preaching, too. Okay, you skipped this verse. You should have had it in there. And God sticks it, the idea, in my mind. But now that we're in the body of Christ, Ephesians 5, I believe, verse 30, 31, around there, it says we're actually members. We're part of his very flesh and bones. That's how literally we're in the body of Christ, he says. And it's a great mystery, he goes on to say. But anyway, his blood continues to cleanse us. It's like if I cut myself, my body will send out all the white blood, the white blood cells to combat that intruding bacteria from that cut to keep my body from getting sick. The good white blood cells do suffer casualties. Some of them will die in this combat against the infectious bacteria. And the dead white blood cells become pus. But my body fought bad bacteria and cleansed me. In the same way as we're being saved by his life that continually fights for us. It's an ongoing active verb tense. Being saved is said three times in the New Covenant. And those of us being saved experience the power of God through the cross, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1.18. By the way, I don't always have to say stake or pole or tree or anything but cross. People think, well, you can't say cross because pagans use the cross. Well, they had a temple too. They had priests too. They had sacrifices too. They took a bath too. Does everything that pagans did mean we can't we can't keep it so in other words uh, we know historically that when they crucified people the Romans did whatever was the simplest thing to do and so sometimes it was just an upright pole, pole with your arms above your head sometimes it was a pole that was attached to an existing tree sometimes it was a pole that was attached to an existing pole already there they often had them on the major routes <clears throat> they had a a historian who's written many books tell me that that was the case. So as people would come into town, they would see, okay, this is what happens when you mess with the Romans. 
Anyway, so Messiah continues to save us by cleansing us as we sin. As long as we can confess, as long as we repent, of course. So let's turn to 1 John 1, verses 7 to 9. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses, ongoing tense, not just washed away or cleansed, but cleanses us from all sin. If we say we don't have sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. First John 1, 9 now. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So this ongoing saving that's going on by being in Yeshua, being part of his body, it's his ongoing cleansing by his blood. That's why, that's why it might be one of the reasons why it says we're being saved, because they know we're all, we all still sin from time to time, and we still need to be saved day by day, week by week from those. And he does, God does. So, and Jesus is also God. So Paul says we must examine ourselves before taking Passover bread and wine. But in this examination, by the verses that come just before that, Paul reminds us it is the very body and cup of our Lord. So my focus on this website, lightontherock.org, has always been to focus on Yeshua, our Savior, not on myself, not on you. He's the light. Frankly, he's the, he's the rock, light on the rock. We must examine ourselves even as we keep the focus on Yeshua. I'll explain as we go along. If our focus is on the self, we'll end up either self-righteous, now that's really being blind, or very depressed. I say blind because we could have avoided that if we focused on Yeshua. There's another scripture that tells us to examine whether you be in the faith, 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Our biggest belief in the faith, in the faith, I believe, means that your set of beliefs must surely be that Yeshua came as the Son of God, lived a perfect life for us so he could offer that perfect life in our stead to be sacrificed for us instead of me and you having to die. And then God the Father resurrected him from the dead. We absolutely believe that. We confess that. We speak of that. When I went just yesterday about my infected finger, I went to an infectious disease specialist uh, to get a booking made because it's not going anywhere so far. And I just noticed somebody had the lady I was talking to and she was working hard at the desk. And I noticed that she had a, a little four, three by five card or something that she'd written on. One nail plus, I'm sorry, one, what was, what'd you say? Three nails plus one cross equals Jesus, my savior. Something like that. One nail plus three cross. What I, uh, I mean, three, three nails and one cross. That's the one thing I remembered. And after waiting a minute or so, I said, so you're a believer? She so says, absolutely. And I said, I am too. And speak out about the cross. Speak out about your belief. We talked a while about it. There is another scripture that tells us to examine the faith. And we're in the faith. So as the very Son of God, his one life covers us all as we accept him. And if Christ was not resurrected, then all of this was in vain. In vain, because we need his perfect life to continue to save us. As we're being saved from the sins we still commit sometimes. So I believe we're to be focused on Yeshua. We must come to know him personally. Paul said his one passion in life was that I may know him. I've called everything else a bunch of dung, he says, rubbish. What I want now is to come to know him. Paul wrote that. I don't feel I know him well enough yet, he's saying. Philippians 3, 9 to 10. And his biggest quest, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Why did he say his resurrection? Because Paul wanted his Messiah to now come and be his life, come the resurrected life. The resurrection Jesus now must live in you, must now live in me. And this will take what I've called constant contact lately, as in prayer without ceasing. 
have your regular prayer, of course, in the morning. And if any of you aren't praying every single day, are you ever in trouble? I'm not going to pull any punches on that. You're being really dumb and stupid if you're not praying every day. So am I if I ever do that. But not only should we pray every day, I say we're being dumb and stupid because we're not going to be able to let the Holy Spirit work in our lives the way it should if we're not taking the time to at least do that. Seek, for you, seek you first the kingdom of God. Seek you first the kingdom of God, Matthew 6, 33, and His righteousness. And all the things we worry about, you got to hurry up and get this done and get going on this, and we skip prayer. Don't do that. What I'm saying is besides those prayers, by all means, do constant contact. A lot of short bursts of prayers throughout the day to Father and Savior as we thank them. Bless God. Plead for help if you're being tempted or need help. Plead for wisdom. Plead for kindness. Repent of wrong thoughts. Bless Him and thank Him for that beautiful dragonfly that just went by. I think they're beautiful. And we keep doing this until Galatians 6, 19 says, Until Christ... No, that's the, that's the verse for Israel of God. There's a different one, until Christ is formed in you. I'll put it in my notes. I think it's Galatians 3, actually, or something like that. I'll put it in my notes. He is now our life. Until Christ himself is formed in me and you. That will take constant contact. So it's central to examine our, examining ourselves. Central to that is to be sure that Christ is our life now. Colossians 3, verse 3. Okay, my life is hidden in Christ, in God. And then verse 4, Christ who is our life. Okay, so in Galatians 2.20, I no longer live. The old self's got to die. Take some work. Let's do it. Let's pray to God that he will help us put it to death. Mortify, therefore, the deeds of the flesh. Colossians 3.5 says. And what's happening in our lives is really him now living in us, working in us, if we're doing it right. Now, he mentions also, let's read this again, 1 Corinthians 11, 27 to 29, verse 27, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup in an un, of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Let a man examine himself and let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's not esteeming, not discerning, not considering the Lord's body. Years ago, the result of that last phrase, not discerning the Lord's body, resulted in many, many sermons going to gory detail about scourging. How they had bone and bits of metal and I won't get into it, but anyway. And somehow this was esteeming the body, what he went through for us. And then the gory details of the scourging, the crucifixion, and how that all was done. But the body of Christ, it says the Lord's body, the Lord's body is also, sure, it's his own flesh and blood, body. But the body of Christ is also his body of believers. You! Colossians 1.24, Colossians 1.18, he is the head of the body, the church. So we brethren and members make up his one body. And that means we're also part of each other. Romans 12, verses 4 and 5. In the New Century Version, it says, Romans 12, verses 4 and 5. Each of us has a body with many parts. We have arms and legs and teeth and lips and ears and so on. And these parts all have different uses. In the same way, we are many. But in Christ, in Christ, I love that phrase. We're going to talk about it soon. We are all one body. Each one is a part of that body. Each part belongs to all the other parts. So, you know, the mouth and the, the, mouth and the nose and the, the hands, they've all got to, and the feet, they've all got a part to play, and they've got to esteem the other parts. Paul even talks about that in 1 Corinthians, I think it's 12. In context before and after this message, besides stating the actual body and life of Christ, this is my body, we have to esteem that, of course, Paul, I believe, is also addressing the way we interact with other believers, other church members, the body of Christ. 
how the Corinthians were observing Passover meal and service, and the service in, in Corinth was horrible. Some got drunk. Others were pigging out. Others had nothing to eat. Nobody waited for anyone. God wasn't being glorified in the body of Christ. The poor individual members especially were being disregarded and ignored. Some were going hungry. In context, this is all found in 1 Corinthians 11, verses 20 to 22, and also 1 Corinthians 11, verses 29 to 32. In context, Paul is talking about also examining their mindset and behavior with other believers, because if you don't, a lot of you are going to die, he says, from illnesses. We'll read that. Paul wants more consideration for the members of the body. It's very focused on the way we treat each other. What did we find, though? What did we find when we looked at Corinth going on? And in the body of Christ today, for that matter, there were factions. I'm a Peter. I'm a Paul. I'm a Barnabas. I'm of this offshoot. I'm of this branch of the church. And now we say we're all a bunch of branches. It's more like a bunch of uh, twigs and, and uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, splinters, <laughs> the splintered branches. Splinters hurt. I'm a Barnabas. I'm Church of God. I'm Hebrew Roots. I'm Messianic. Stop it already. There were, there were doctrinal differences between the brethren. Paul didn't put them out of the church, but taught it correctly. Like even the one on the resurrection. Some of you say that there'll be no resurrection. Or that Christ wasn't resurrected. He didn't just say, I want those people thrown out of the church. No, he taught it correctly. They were going to lawsuits, going to court, suing each other. They were not building on the foundation of Yeshua, on Christ, with gold, silver, and precious stones, but with wood, hay, and stubble. There was open sex going on, being tolerated within the membership, as even there are things like that happening in the church today, in various congregations. Shacking up going on. There were marriage issues, even forbidding people exercising the gifts of the Spirit. If you admitted to praying in the Spirit, that was somehow bad. We're to live in the Spirit, walk in the Spirit, worship in the Spirit, worship God in the Spirit and in truth. Justified in the Spirit. So do we cancel someone who doesn't believe exactly like we do on that point or any other point? So God's church, usually referred to in Scripture by different names, one of them is Church of God, is used seven or eight times. Believers is used as, as well, several times. There's even Church of the Firstborn, Hebrews 12, 23. Church of the Firstborn, or Church of Christ. And Christians, they're called Christians, Acts 11, 26, first in Antioch. I like believers. I, I just relate more to that word. They're all fine. Maybe some of us put walls that are unnecessary. Dividing us from others who also believe in Jesus Christ as our Savior. The main doctrine. Because they don't go by maybe all of our other beliefs. But they are witnessing for Christ. Maybe stronger than you are. So we're proclaiming the Lord's death till he comes. And so obviously it's a time when we come solemnly drink and eat but neither should Passover feel like a dirge or funeral we just had our massive sin debt cancelled but keep in mind after repenting we still do sin so stop already some of you with the notion that if I if she really repented why does she still do the same sins do you ever gossip anymore have you ever repented of gossip then have you, you still gossip do you never lose faith you ever have you have you never worried still? Do you not ever worry from time to time? Even Abraham lied twice about Sarah. He neglected the fact that she was she was his half sister. But he neglected the fact that she was also his wife. Twice. But I'll take Passover because he continues to cleanse me, even though I do sometimes still sin. But let's not be so harsh on each other, because with the judgment we render will be the judgment we will, we will receive. Anyway, so uh, once you have examined yourself, 
take the bread, take the cup, eat it, drink it with confidence. We do ourselves do use real red wine. I'm not going to condemn you who use grape juice. I know some of the Messianics or some of the Hebrew roots people prefer grape juice. It is a fruit of the vine. Jesus said, I'll no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until it comes to pass in the kingdom. But at the marriage feast in Cana, which was just before Passover in John 2, it definitely was the best wine possible. That could not possibly have been grape juice. That was just before Passover. And Cana, by the way, had, I'll maybe give a, an audio on Cana or, or blog. Uh, Cana, Cana, however you say it. But uh, Passover was definitely in Yeshua's mind. My hour has not yet come, he said to his mother. And she asked him to do something. And then she, he turns six of the um, ceremonial containers of water. Uh, it was used for cleansing purposes. He had them filled to the brim and made wine out of that. Okay, but anyway, continuing on. Another good reason to be examining ourselves, not just so we're not guilty of the body and blood of Christ, but 11.29, 1 Corinthians 11.29 also says this, having to do with healings. He who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. I don't think at this point he's still talking about the flesh and blood individual body of Jesus Christ. He's talking about the church. He's talking about believers. For this reason, because you're not judging the body correctly, for this reason many among you are weak and sick, and a number of them are dying, sleep. But if we judge ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. But when we're judged, we're disciplined by the Lord, so we will not be condemned along with the world. Paul is saying because you're not preparing properly for Passover, there are people in the fellowship who are getting sick and some of them are dying. I'm not saying that those who are dying and getting sick are the ones who aren't preparing properly. I'm saying that it's just explained that this is happening as a result. Have you noticed we could sure use some more healings? I've had dramatic healings here and there in my life, including cancer, but then other times nothing, like this infected finger. And I believe I have the same faith. And I even prayed last night, am I not considering the body like I should, the body of Christ, the church? I'm really examining myself, wondering why my fingers aren't being, helped, aren't being healed. I still have diabetes. I still have other issues. But in the church, we have prayer requests galore. But who's getting miraculous instant healing? Maybe this is a huge point we must all absorb. Start esteeming the brethren better and we will see more healings. It's the same principle as 1 Peter 3, 7 where husbands are said, told to esteem, to honor their wives. We must esteem and honor each other. 1 Peter 3, 7, honor your wives lest your prayers be hindered. Same principle here. If you're not honoring the body, your prayers are being hindered. And I think our prayers are being hindered. Because too many of us aren't regarding and esteeming other, be other believers if they're not a part of our direct corporate denomination or fellowship or if they believe slightly differently in some areas than we do. So some ignore those other believers. Some belittle them. We find reasons to believe they aren't really converted. They can't really have God's spirit. Well, be careful. Paul says this leads to unanswered prayers just like Peter did about husbands and wives. I want to start seeing more prayer requests being answered positively. Paul says right here and now, it could be the, because of the way we treat one another. So what can we do to help heal the body, bring people together? Jesus told us that those who are not gathering with me are scattering. If you're not doing some concrete things to bring people of God together, you are scattering. And I had just been doing a study on that. 
I got to tell you, I was praying one time right after that. I was saying, I don't know how to gather people together. No one's going to listen to me or come, you know. And it was just like a really clear voice that no one would hear, but it was like real strong in my mind. Have a brick of wood reunion, you know, where I went to college. Those people had put each other out. They had they weren't fellowshipping with one another. Have a brick of wood reunion. And I followed that urging, even though I... At first said, no one's going to come, Lord. He said, have a brick and wood reunion. And they all did come. We got almost everybody to come in, in our class and a couple of other classes. It was for our class. And what a day of joy that was. Everybody had smiles for four days. And so, and they still are reuniting, still coming together. Even those who weren't there, they've heard about it. And people were afraid to contact one another because they'd gone to different denominations now by this point or whatever. But God wants us together. So visit other fellowships that have believers near you, even if they believe slightly differently than you. Let your visits be a testimony. You're not part of this scattering. You don't have to uh, confine yourself to just one fellowship. A lady I, I know out in Texas does that. Really, really pleased to hear that. She goes from one congregation to another. Thank you. You know who you are discern esteem the body of christ commit to being more zealous in the coming year commit to more prayer time more bible study less wasted time with social media and useless movies time is short by 2030 it'll be exactly 2000 years maybe 2031 maybe 2030 maybe 2029 20, uh, but i'm pretty sure it's 2030 is exactly 2,000 years since Jesus Christ was crucified and then raised again. And then soon after, uh, 2030, we'll be getting into, well, let me say it this way. 2030 is 2,000 years. A year for 1,000, a year the same as 1,000 years. I mean, a day is the same as 1,000 years. A day, my notes are wrong. A day is the same as 1,000 years, okay? I'll fix my notes. So we're 2,000 years away. We're two days away from that happening. And then we'll be starting in 2030 or 2031, uh, the third day since that happened. Now let's read Hosea 6, verse 1 and 2. Come and let us return to the Lord, to Jehovah, For he was torn, he has torn, but he will heal us. He has stricken but he will bind us up just before the return of Yeshua. It's going to be the time of worst trouble the world's ever seen. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live in his sight. I have lots more I could discuss, but let's, Let's go continue on here. Please go pray. Please rededicate yourself, your life. And so I recommend you do check out a teaching, by the way, that I, I'll post in my notes about cherishing your very high calling. And I've gotten a lot of very positive uh, responses to that particular sermon. It's, it's titled... If you put the whole title in, you'll have to put the whole title in for it to show up. Six reasons to cherish your calling as first fruits. Six reasons to cherish your calling. And it's, it, it'll be in my notes. Another place to examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. By, by, by looking them up, I mean using the search bar in my Light on the Rock. We can examine ourselves, see if we're in the faith, of course. Are you bringing glory to God in everything you do? Are you finding that you're finally really learning to trust him and not worry so much? That you're focused on him no matter what he's allowing into your life? Are you grateful for everything he does, even the so-called bad things, rough things? Thank God in all things and for all things. I have sermon on that. It's really tough. In my really painful, swollen, infected fingers, I had to... Apply my own sermon. Thank you for this finger. I know you're teaching me something. Teaching me patience. You're teaching me that I need to be nicer to the church brethren. And maybe not just those in the fellowship I'm a part of. Examine yourself. If you're grateful for what he's done for you. 
examine yourself to see if you're showing appreciation to our master we can go on and on and please pray more all of us make a new habit if you've got, gotten out of the habit please do Isaiah 55 verse 6 and 7 the Lord seek the Lord while he may be found call upon him while he is near let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous his thoughts let him return to Jehovah please you guys please return to Jehovah and he will have plenty of mercy on him if we do these things we be sure to come to Passover take the bread take the wine take it in a worthy manner I want to remind you all that the only one who was found worthy in heaven to open the scrolls nobody on earth nobody in heaven in, in Revelation 4 God the Father holding the scroll it says worthy are you yes he's worthy no one else was worthy to come look at the scroll look into it open it anything except until the Lamb of God came then they all started singing these praises to the Lamb of God to Jesus Christ worthy is the Lamb now that I am in him now that I'm part of his body now that I am in him guess what now that you're in him guess what now you are worthy if you just try to be worthy on your own you're probably gonna fail but if you say in those short bursts of prayer like I like to give Jesus I want to be worthy you're the only one worthy I still have wrong thoughts I still get impatient I still lose my temper sometimes I please I don't want to be like this and I want to esteem you I want to esteem the body of Christ I want to esteem you yourself please be my life because you alone besides father are worthy and so let's come to Passover let's come in a solemn joy I want to be sure I'm in agreement with God that he will see the blood of the lamb over me and will pass over my sins that's where the word Passover comes from I really really need this Passover I really look forward to the positive messages of the bread and the wine and I want to take Passover having also been forgiven that I have forgiven myself find that hard find that real hard some of you make sure that I keep it hard to forgive myself stop doing that we can really more easily understand the forgiveness of father when we see the forgiving heart in the eyes of his children who have found out about your sins or my sins and they still are forgiving so I want to make sure I've forgiven everyone else who sinned against me or have had sins that I may be forgiven and I want to make sure that I've forgiven myself no longer looking back let's help each other forgive them let's help people forgive themselves by us being really forgiving to and accepting and loving Look what Jesus did with with Zacchaeus he knew Zacchaeus had a lot of money <laughs> and Zacchaeus come down Come down from that tree because we got to have lunch at your place and there was a great celebration celebration of forgiveness where was his track record there was no track record yet be willing to forgive as quickly as God forgives a woman caught in adultery neither do I condemn you now go and sin no more it was in the no condemnation that one has the strength and the will and the hope to go sin no more would she have sinned again of course she would have would he have condemned her then no no because he's the one Yeshua is the one who taught us who taught me and you even 70 times 7 you forgive your brother seven times in a day for the same thing He's asking forgiveness again you can't say well you've shown no signs of repentance I'm not gonna forgive you you keep doing it our master said seven times seven 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 times in a day even forgive that person because that's what I'm doing for you so many times you sin in a day and I've got to forgive you now you do the same that's my life living in you if we would live like that 
we would come together as a body and you'd let forgiven people attend and fellowship. So as I examine myself for Passover, I realize every single one of my sins and your sins have been forgiven. Satan's head has been stepped on and crushed. We're washed, we're covered in the blood of Messiah. How does how are we cleansed in the blood? Blood is very staining. We're cleansed in the blood by 1 John 1, 7 and 9 that he continues to cleanse. It's talking about the body, that the infection gets started and his body's blood goes and kills that infection. That's how he cleanses us in an ongoing way, how God, you know, I'm talking about an ongoing way. God kills the infection, kills the sin by his blood. And as we're being saved and he passes over our sins passover praise yah hallelujah i had somebody tell me i can't use all those hebrew names you say yehovah and yah and yeshua why do you do that and i said so you would never do that he said no i never would do that i said you never say hallelujah that whole phrase there is hebrew let's all praise yeah anyway so hallelujah let's focus on the victory we have in yeshua and jesus have a most meaningful passover dear father in heaven we come before you now and we just ask your blessing on this passover all around the whole world send out your anointing flow the holy spirit let us prepare for it properly let us come in a worthy manner through christ who alone is worthy now that he's our body and we're in his body, we can come and take this Passover in a worthy manner of pondering, considering all the things you've forgiven, including forgiving ourselves. Let us be kind and loving to one another. As you loved us, as you forgave us, that all people will know that this is your body, this is your people. Thank you, dear Yeshua. Thank you for volunteering. And thank you, Father, for letting it happen. Thank you both. Thank you. Pour out your Holy Spirit now upon us. We praise you. We thank you. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.